okay, I'm sure this is going to break in all kinds of interesting ways. I've got a totally new, I've got a totally new setup on my on my computer now, so I'm I'm sure this is going to be busted. But we'll but we'll see if it happens. I got a, I've got a new screen. I got actually two new screens. So I used to have. I don't know if you if you saw before. I was like I was like looking all around because I had these screens on these gigantic, you know, sort of like four arms showing me these tiny little screens. And now I've just sort of got like one big screen that I'm using. So, all right, we should be live. Hey, everybody. Welcome. Uh, welcome to 2021. We did it. We made it. 2020 was a dumpster fire, but 2021 is going to be just terrific. It's going to be the best year ever. Uh, no, I, I think we've got some uh, rough time to go through before we get there. But uh, but we made it back. It's time for our regularly scheduled programming back to episodes of, of Open Space on Mondays and my guest interviews on random times, random days of the week. So uh, and this random time day of the week, I got Chris Carr, who is one of our uh, co-hosts on the Weekly Space Hangout. Hey, Chris, how's it going? Oh, it's doing great. Nice to be with you, Fraser. And congratulations on making it through 2020 into 2021. We did it. Thank you, and congratulations to you. And hopefully 2021 will be slightly less bad. Yeah, yeah, slightly. I think we're going to have a, still a rough beginning of the of the year with, mm -hmm. you know, it's not like the with the vaccine, the pandemic's gone away, but hopefully over time more and more still get jabbed in the arm and then we'll be allowed to reenter the population. So I hope. My plan is to be able to go outside with with other people. I, think that's, I, think that's a... <laughs> I mentioned that I'm, re I'm really looking forward to going places and doing things and meeting people. <laughs> so, so for people who don't know who you are, why don't you just sort of give us a background? Who are you? What do you do? Well, so uh, hello everyone. Uh, I am Chris Carr. I am an astronomer and astrophysicist in training at Columbia University in the city of New York. Uh, I've done. Uh, research in cosmology, dark matter, and in all things galaxies related with special attention to our home in the Milky Way. Um, outside the academy, uh, uh, I've had a lot, lifelong interest in science communication in all of its forms, uh, for giving talks with the public, uh, from science radio uh, for, for many years, uh, and to now YouTube, where, where I'm now uh, a, a co-host with Weekly Space Hangout. Uh, and so I'm so over the course uh, of the hour, I'm, I'm, I'm glad to talk more about myself and about the, the cool things that uh, about galaxies and so forth that I've learned over the years. Well, I mean, and I think you couldn't have been coming into this field at a better time when you've got just a phenomenal observatory like Gaia that is just delivering an unbelievable amount of, of scientific data. I, I, you know, I go on and on and on about how enthusiastic I am about that observatory. It's kind of amazing. Um, so, all right. So, so let's talk about um, your work. So, you're at Columbia. So, are you associated with the Cool Worlds Lab, or are you outside of that group? I'm outside of that group, but I I'm associated in, in the sense that I'm friends with many of them. Yeah, it, it feels like like I I'm not sure what's going on at Columbia, but there is like clearly a a real interesting group of people working there, working on some really interesting ideas in a very kind of collaborative and, and uh, I don't know, they, there's something magical going on at, at Columbia. Yeah, yeah that, that, I think that's actually one of the things that, that drew me to, to Columbia is that it's kind of at the, at the nucleus of sort of the New York uh, astronomy space, you know, because not only do you have Columbia, but you also have NYU, you have CUNY, you have AMMH, uh, you, you have Princeton, not, not, far, not far down the road. And so Columbia is really kind of like the hub where all these interesting characters and uh, and and people sort of cycle through, and so they they kind of stop by every now and then at Columbia, uh, and so it, it's just sort of this great environment where where you, all these interesting people coming by, and, and a great place to explore ideas and meet people. Yeah, I mean, I mean, we've talked to David Kipping many times on, you know, and he does the, the Cool Worlds Lab and his his group, and they're all looking for exoplanets and exo moons, and he's quite interested in in, uh, you know extraterrestrial civilizations and, and some of these deep questions, which, it, which is great. And I, and I, and I really appreciate that from just from a, from a university that is both doing rigorous science, but also willing to explore the kinds of ideas that really ignite the imagination of the public and, and, 
whenever I can find people like that, it's just sort of like my favorite people to talk to because they're, you know, they they could both be hard science, but also they're willing to entertain my nutty uh, ideas and, and questions. So I think it's, I think it's terrific. But your specialty is, you know, in galaxies, right? Yes, yes. Uh, my, uh, I, I, I would say like all of my work so far at Columbia is sort of focused in the realm of, of galaxy evolution, galaxy formation. Uh, and this is, it, it's kind of been like a, something that, that stuck with me for many years because because I, I kind of remember uh, when I was younger, when I was first being introduced to astronomy, you see like these these incredible images uh, from of like Andromeda or like the, the swooping yeah. fire alarms of, of like M101 or all these other like uh, amazing uh, features that they, that these that these structures possess, uh, and so I think as I got older, like during my my undergrad, like when you start sort of learning in a more structured way about what's happening, like you have star formation, you have mergers of other galaxies, you have like black holes, and uh, and, and all and all these sort of processes that are kind of conspiring and contradicting one another over billions of years, and like the fact that they sort of at, at the end of all of that you sort of produce this elegant structure that, that we call a galaxy. It, I think it's still something that moves me in like in a very like like fundamental way. Well, uh, I, I think the, the thing for me is like that it's all just a consequence of gravity and then and then outward and then I guess outward forces like, you know, hitting the equilibrium of, mm -hmm. you know, the stars. But at the end of the day, like the entire shape of the galaxy, the interactions of all of the stars, every all the gas, all the planets, is all just gravity working its, I guess, sort of, I don't know, clockwork method to bring it all together. Yes, gra gravity is the great sculptor. Yeah. Um, well, sort of admiring from afar. Um, and so, and so how, and so, you know, you were inspired by by these, you know, beautiful pictures of galaxies, and and then how did that lead you into actually choosing that as a as a specialty in astronomy? Yeah, and so I, I think it was really trying to understand how like all these chaotic processes that that are that are happening inside galaxies can produce like that 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 great and like amazing structure. And so part of me going into grad school really wanted to understand that at a deeper level, not not just at the level of of Sort of a, a distant admiration, but but at a sort of a deeper, like fundamental way, like how those structures actually come to be, uh, and and so that that was really my and that's still my focus today of, of why like I, I see galaxy formation as as such a uh, profound like pursuit. So then, what have we learned fairly recently? I mean, as you have been going through this process, from from a fairly I guess surface level like galaxies are pretty to here's how they actually come together. What has surprised you? What has sort of guided your, your research through this? Right, and so, so I think this is actually like a good like intro into like the work I'm doing, net, work I've been doing over the past few years uh, with uh, my advisor, uh, uh, Catherine Johnston uh, and her group, which is really concerned with, with what we're talking about, how gravity uh, is such a profound uh, sculptor of how galaxies not interact with each other, but also like uh, internally how the stars interact, how the orbits change. Uh, and, and so like my research has, has mostly been concerned with the Milky Way uh, and, and how the, the Milky Way is actually responding to the, the current merger that is, that is happening between the Milky Way and one of its dwarf galaxies, uh, Sagittarius. And so my research is mostly concerned with how the, the stars and the disk have been sort of uh, responding to that uh, disruption uh, that that's been taking place over the last few billions of years, uh, and so how this all connects to to galaxy formation within a cosmological context is, and so if you go way back to sort of the early universe, like how we how our, our picture of how galaxies form is that small things uh, build to make big things, right? And so we have these tiny dwarf galaxies that are sort of merging, and so and slowly they start building like these uh, these galaxies that that become uh, identifiable today. Uh, and so you can describe galaxies as growing from inside out, right? So the so the the older regions tend to be to, the inner regions tend to be older, the outer regions tend to be younger, and so this has consequences for the stars, right? Because 
So you would expect older, more old stars to be interested more in the inner regions of the galaxy and more younger stars in the, in the periphery. And you would also expect more metal rich stars in the inner regions uh, because since the inner region is older, you've had more time for stars to die and to then spill their guts out into the, right. into the galaxy and so forth. And so the end result is, is you should expect a slope uh, as you go march out in radius from the center uh, of age and in, in metallicity, so how much iron they have. But when you actually do look out from our vantage point in the, in the Milky Way, which is like 20, 26,000 light years or so from the center, it, you, you do see that, but it's not nearly as strong as you would expect, given that inside out history. Hmm. And, and so astronomers have really been trying to grapple with this uh, over the past few decades as to why you're not seeing uh, such a clear effect. And what we've really come to over the past few past few decades is to understand that the birth positions of stars in the Milky Way don't of stars in the Milky Way does not necessarily reflect where they are today. Right. Okay. That, that in fact stars move right. can move throughout the disk over the course of their lifetimes. And you would and so think that they would stick to their their lane. As they're like a like if you know if it's like the uh, I don't know like a record and you've got the the sort of ruts around you know the grooves around right. the record and you expect the stars to be going around whatever they take two hundred twenty five million years to go around the Milky Way, but the reality is is that they're they're orbiting the center and they're getting closer and they're interacting with each other and they're just drifting away from where they where they started. Yeah, and and so this process is called a radial migration. Huh. And and one. And there's been a lot of attention paid to what is actually happening inside the disk that causes this process, namely uh, things like bars or spiral arms. So that those beautiful structures that we admire, are they actually could stir quite a lot of trouble inside the disk because they're constantly shuffling uh, the stars from, their, from where they were, through their gravitational interactions, moving stars to enter in a disk or, or uh, more out or in the disk. And so there's been a lot of attention paid to these mechanisms but what can also be responsible for this process are external influences as well. So if you had like a like a satellite falling in, that, that that's also like an important thing you have to consider. And uh, so I'm I, again, I'm kind of imagining the bar as like this. I don't know. I'm going to use a Canadian term like a zamboni. Like it's just sort of sweeping around, sort of at the center of the galaxy, kind of churning material around. Mm -hmm. As yeah. it goes around and around and around, but I know, and I know that the, the 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 purpose of the bar is to also funnel gas into the center mm -hmm. of the of the galaxy, and I, we're still not sure whether or not the Milky Way has a bar, right? So I don't know what a zamboni is, but oh. I'm sure. It <laughs> <laughs> when you play hockey in Canada, um, you have a little machine that goes around and cleans off the ice. That you know, oh, that, okay. That's, that's called that's, Zamboni. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's a piece of Canadiana for you, right there. Invented in Canada. Yeah. I don't know much about very hockey. Canadian problem. Yeah. <laughs> Come on, you've got some. You got some hockey teams in in New York. I, I I'll I'll take your word for it. Yeah. But but yes. Uh, but so there you go. That's, the... I believe that will be the title. Milky Way Zamboni. Yeah. No, for the for this episode. All right. No, please please continue. <laughs> But, but yes, what you're saying about the bar, uh, it's, it's an important role. So the Milky Way does, we, we do believe the Milky Way does have a bar. Uh, we, we've actually gone to the point that through the help of, of those great uh, astronomical surveys like Gaia, that we're actually able to see the bar. Like we actually see like this elongated structure uh, in the inner regions of the Oh, okay, okay. So, so oh. which is actually quite phenomenal that we can actually see the bar. Uh, so um, thanks to Gaia, mystery solved. Yes, uh, but there, of course, like there have been many people who, who've who've speculated that the Milky Way was at a bar and, and so forth. But it was really with Gaia that we were able to see firsthand that the bar does in fact uh, is in fact there. So uh, with the case of the Milky Way, you you also have like these external influences, like satellites that that occasionally fall in uh, and sort of cause trouble uh, as they as they plow through the disk. And so since the Milky Way is also in the in the course of this merger with with Sagittarius. My work has been trying to figure out how the stars respond to that infall of, of Sagittarius and what are the remaining remnants uh, that would linger uh, in the Milky Way today from that past history uh, of, of, of the merger with Sagittarius.
Right. Um, and so when we think of the of the Milky Way today as just this beautiful grand spiral, you know, we see examples of these out in the across the across the universe. Right. Um, the reality is a lot more complicated that there is some bar that the, I know the disk is somewhat warped, that that there are the pieces of these chewed up dwarf galaxies swirling around inside as they're being digested by the Milky Way. And I mean, I love this idea of of this layering that that you sort of started with the nucleus of the galaxy is the first whatever was the first proto dwarf galaxy that that started. And that's where all the earliest star from each and then each galaxy kind of each dwarf galaxy that added to the mix made it more and more complicated more layers the center is where the is sort of the mature part mm -hmm. but then you've got that mixing so it's not like everything is perfectly striated like you might find in geology you've actually got things that were formed close in have made their way out to sort of bring heavier elements into the outer into the outer portions of the Milky Way. So I mean, is this I mean, what a surprise, everything's more complicated than we thought. What, what, what does what does this what are the implications for ideas about like galactic habitability and things like that now that we sort of have a more more nuanced idea of how the galaxy operates? So by, by galactic habitability, you mean the, the potential to to harbor life? Because mm -hmm, mm -hmm. before it was like the core mm -hmm too hot, too much radiation, the outer edges, too dead, no heavy metals. Mm -hmm. you got to be a place like, oh, what, what a surprise where the sun is to have life, right? And now it's a lot more nuanced, right? Right, uh, right, certainly. Uh, so I think, so I think Moya would be a perfect, perfect person for you, for you, for you to talk to this about Moya McTeer. Who's yeah, also we, we already, we already talked to her. Yeah. <laughs> Last season. Yeah. Yeah, so the the implications for galactic habitability isn't isn't really something that uh, that that I've thought about all that much. But but I, I guess when you when you think about it, though, because uh, because if the milk if the the sun is in that region of, of galactic habitability of around like seven to nine, like at KPC, I, I know that's we we astronomers like to use parsecs, but within the region of 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 the sun, if that's if that's if that's good enough. Is it that the region itself is is what's galactic galactically habitable? Like if a star sort of drifts into that region, is it now does that have a habitable? Of habitability? <laughs> or or is it stars that are just born in that region that are inherently more habitable? That 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 question I'm not sure, and and I don't know if other people have looked at that more deeply, uh, but that's definitely something that that I I'd be interested in reading more about. Yeah, yeah. Um, so so then. I know there are some really big questions that have been outstanding for a long time. And one of the big ones is what came first? The, the, the supermassive black holes of the hearts of galaxies or the galaxies that surround them. And we seem to see a supermassive black hole at the heart of every galaxy out there. Um, what is the current kind of thinking as, as the mergers? Like did, did these galaxies form all in one go or do they form like, Top down or bottom up, I guess is where I'm getting at. <laughs> right, yeah. So it goes back to what we were talking about earlier about about galaxies in the early universe. Uh, so I, I think the current the current idea is that galaxies form inside out and and top down. And, and the reason why is that so as so as as the as the, so the matter accumulates, then you have these these big clouds that sort of slowly uh, sort of settle down into disk. So they sort of begin very puffed up, uh, and but then over time, like as the interactions with other things slow down, as sort of get more isolated and they sort of get get more angular momentum, they sort of flatten into these nice discs. Uh, and so the end result is that you get these really puff, puffy up, puffy like puffed up galaxies in the in the in a high redshift, so at the very early early universe, and then you you see the formation of these more nice, nice clean, uh, more uh, attractive disc as the universe ages and we're always reporting on on universe today about about seeing galaxies that are surprisingly evolved for their distance mm -hmm. so what do you think is the mechanism that's going on there that's making these galaxies look more mature than you would expect them to be yeah that, that's a that's a very like interesting like problem about about like 
the, so this picture I described to you sounds very nice, right? It's like a very gradual uh, accumulation of, of material to form like the galaxies that we see today. But there, but the presence of these like highly developed galaxies, the like like galaxies that you would expect to see today, but at the high but at high redshift, uh, is still I think a very um, unexplored problem that doesn't have, at least to me, a very convincing answer quite yet uh, about how structure can evolve so quickly. Uh, and so that, that's definitely something that, that other people are looking at quite, quite, uh, quite strongly that, that I don't think there really is a, a convincing answer yet in the literature uh, for why we see that yet. But it's, and so it's clearly not like all one way or all one, it's, it's obvious, it's not obvious that it's one way or the other. And so meaning that it's, of course, more complicated than anyone sort of expected. Um, so what role does dark matter play in the in this evolution process of, of a galaxy? Right. Uh, and so this and so dark matter plays like a very important role in, in the in the buildup of structure. Uh, and so you so you may have heard uh, about this terms of very early on when we were thinking about what dark matter could be, uh, if it is cold dark matter or is it hot dark matter? And so what that what that really means is by hot we just mean uh, is it very fast moving is it very light and fast moving or is it very cold and, yeah. and massive like neutrinos so, neutrinos would be an example of a hot kind of dark matter yeah perfect yeah, yeah like, like neutrinos would be an example of a hot dark matter and for cold dark matter the 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 particle that's usually thrown about is called a WIMP which is like a weakly massive interacting right. particle which is very slow moving and so if you have like a very slow moving dark matter, that means it's very easy for it to, to sort of, for gravity or to, to grab dark matter and for it to, to build up structure. And so if you have cold dark matter, then structure builds up in the early universe sooner than what you would, uh, a lot quicker oh. than what you would expect uh, if you had hot dark matter. Because okay. If you hot, so if you have hot dark matter, that's like neutrinos, it's, everything's moving very fast, it's it's it will take longer for for structure to build up, uh, and so, and so the fact that we see structure very early on in the universe is indicative that dark matter is likely colder, uh, and so that and that's why uh, these I think these ideas like wimps are so popular within literature, and why and while ideas like uh, hot dark matter have fallen out of favor, and so you could almost measure the speed of the dark matter by how quickly the galaxies are forming in the early universe. Because as you say, neutrinos are going just a fraction of the speed of light. They're passing through your body all the time. Right now, you have countless neutrinos going through your body thanks to the sun. But you probably also have the occasional dark matter but the wimp but there's but they're meandering through your body as opposed to zipping it close to the speed of light they're moving slowly but they're also not interacting as well yeah. and and so that's one of the biggest pieces of evidence that that dark matter has to be this colder particle as opposed to a hot particle oh yeah absolutely and yeah. And I think one of the I think one of those convincing evidences of dark matter for me the one that I always sort of go back to is, so we have the, the, the cosmic microwave background, right? And so you, which is like this afterglow from the Big Bang around 400,000 years after where the, where the first atoms formed. And so the, the radiation was, allow, was allowed to, to escape. Uh, and so since the matter and the radiation were, uh, were coupled, right? Before that, before you had the first atoms, the, the, temperature, the temperature map also tells you about the, the density as well uh, in the universe. And so if you know the density of the universe uh, around 400,000 years after the Big Bang, and you can measure the density today, it's a very simple calculation then. You can just start from, from where you were 400,000 years and then just run the clock forward. And so what it, so what it turns out, if you only look at the matter, the, the visible matter, and then you just run the clock forward, like the, the amount of highly developed structure like 14 billion years later is it's like orders of magnitude lower than what you would need to, to get it to where it is today. So that's why you need the presence of dark matter to provide that extra jolt, that, that extra that extra gravity right. to actually accelerate the, the buildup of structure to get us to where we are now, uh, 14 billion years later. 
Um, now we talked about about Gaia briefly, but I wanted to sort of spend a little more time just talking about Gaia and because I'm sure this is this is this has been a revolution in in your field. And, and it, it's funny, like I just every time every time every time I look at new papers, new journals, there are several papers that are depending on on Gaia data from one of the various releases that have come out. It's a, it's been a total game changer. So can we talk about this this mission a bit and sort of what what the implications have been for astronomy so far and and what we think is going to happen in the future? Right. Yeah. So so Gaia was a a telescope uh, astronomical survey with an, an in collaboration between uh, I think it was, it was the ESA. So the the the, the Europeans were. Uh, we we have them to thank. Yeah, for... well, they're they're the astrometry people. So they they did previous to Gaia, they had the Hipparchos mission and and other astrometry projects. So they've sort of taken on the mantle of astrometry, which is you know measuring the distance to stars. Right, right, yes, and and so we we've used this so this astrometry uh, on I think orders of magnitude more stars than what you, you know what we had with Hipparchus, and to the extent where we have now hundreds of millions of stars within the Milky Way. That have reliable distance measurements. Yeah, I think up to one point eight billion. <laughs> really? Yeah, you see, one point eight billion, and and it's only going to get better uh, as as with future data releases, uh, not only giving us more stars, but also better better uh, uh, understanding of the of the uncertainties on on those distances, so we can do better science uh, with it as well. Uh, and so, like with this like massive like influx of data, I think a strong. Like there, there's more data uh, than like, I, I don't think we have enough galactic dynamicists actually working on the problem, like compared to the to the data. Like, yeah. like there, we need all hands on deck to really understand like what is actually yeah. uh, what's actually going on. Uh, and we, we, we've kind of hinted on it earlier about like all these all the hidden structure uh, of the galaxy that that has made us uh, have a greater appreciation for these smaller uh these smaller structures that that beforehand were completely sort of assumed away and assuming the milky way was in some great equilibrium but we're learning it's definitely not the case um you know mergers we can see i mean again it's it's always so fascinating to me that people can just look at the distance and movement of of a bunch of stars and literally just pick out an a, an ancient galaxy that was consumed by the milky way and you can see it, you know, once you highlight it, like these stars are all kind of moving in the same direction. They all have similar amounts of metallicity. This was a destroyed, this is, this was a victim of the Milky Way. Um, so uh, where do you sort of see Gaia going, you know, you say it's all hands on deck. I mean, is it like you're so busy digesting the data that's already come out of Gaia that you don't have time to sort of look forward and see what's coming down the pike next. Well, I, I think we we have time both to work and to and to dream. I think <laughs> about what's coming forward. Uh, but but I think what what really excites me is is not only the great uh, kinematic data that you're getting from Gaia, but also the ability to to merge that data with with other surveys that are interested in things like chemistry. Uh, so right. you be able to get, so I, I think that's sort of like the next frontier in, in galaxy dynamics is, is merging the dynamical data of stars with their chemical data and using both of those, both of those data sets to, uh, to understand more like the chemodynamical evolution of the Milky Way. Uh, that I think that there's still like an untapped potential there about what, what's to come. Yeah. I mean, the, I know there are some some surveys that are doing like there's oh i forget which which is it gaelic galax there's like there's some there's some surveys yes. that are that are doing uh spectroscopic analysis of stars in kind of the same way that that gaia is doing position and motion but they're saying th this is what the stars are made out of and then you're able to then match those two together what what would be something that you're hoping to see that would sort of give you what you feel would be sort of like a jump forward in in our understanding of the Milky Way? What's what would be some sort of I don't know smoking gun in terms of motion and and chemistry? Right. Yeah. So so I think it's really like 
really, uh, I think, closely matches what I was talking about earlier about how, how if you have these infalling satellites that sort of disrupt the disk, how, how the stars move. So when, when the stars move and you're sort of looking at this process, to, like the aftermath of that process, there's not really, if you're just looking at the dynamics of stars, you can't really say much about, okay, this star, maybe this star migrated, if, migrated from here or from there. You can't really say that because you only have access to dynamical information. So if you have access to the chemistry as well, which, and chemistry is, is a relic of their birth environment. And like, it doesn't, like the, like the metallicity content doesn't change over the lifetime of the star. And so if, so if you know, so if the chemistry tells you where the stars are from and you can use the, 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 the placements of stars today in the Milky Way as a way to reconstruct that, that history uh, of, of radial migration uh, because, because the chemistries of stars are telling you where they're, uh, where they're coming from. It's kind of like a, uh, I, I like to connect it to a, a like a, a dialect, uh, like, because if someone was from, if someone was from, from say like the UK, they sort of retain that dialect no matter where they place them around the globe. Like right. it doesn't matter where you find them, you can you can always say, oh, that person's probably from that the person's UK. probably from, from the UK. Yeah. So the chemistry works the same way of of using of using the, the the chemical makeup as a way to relocate stars back to where they're from and thus reconstructing that history of radial migration in the Milky Way. Um, and so I mean, one of the big I know. Astronomers think they found some of the siblings of the sun. You know, when we look at other at other star forming nebulae, we see say thousands of stars all forming together in the Hyades or in the Pleiades cluster, and they're examples of the kind of nebulae that that our sun must have formed in with other siblings. And then, as you said, those processes are are a lot more dynamic in 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 shifting these stars away from their their home zone to somewhere else in the in the galaxy um and so do you think that that with enough data we could start to almost run the clock backwards for the entire galaxy yeah so so what, what you're describing is, is is what's uh known in, in our circles as chemical tagging so this is this would be so like ideally like the the perfect in the perfect world, what chemical tagging would be is that you you you'd be able to look at any star in the Milky Way, and then relocate it back to its birth cluster, right? Um, so uh, as far as uh, how confident I am that we we'd be able to get there, uh, I'm uh, I would say I'm suspect. Uh, I, I think I, I think probably relocating stars back to their original birth, like primordial cluster, is probably uh, too optimistic, but I do think there is some potential, and at least at uh, at least on like a, on a, on a, like on a birth radius level, that I, I do think the, these these new data sets combined with the kinematic data can make some progress, where we can relocate stars maybe back to like maybe like the the birth radius and the disk. But I, I think if you're trying to reconstruct uh, clusters, uh, you have to you have to wait, take some time when you think about the three body problem how difficult it is to plot the past or future interactions between three objects you're looking at 400 billion and trying to calculate the interactions between all of those stars i can imagine it would be a it would be a complicated calculation to be able to to make uh, we've got a couple of questions that have come in while we've been talking. Um, Arjone is asking, would it make sense to do a long-term survey of the Andromeda galaxy because you can see the whole thing from our perspective? Does does doing those kinds of surveys of other galaxies give us some kind of advantage that we can't from because of the fact that we're inside the Milky Way? Oh, uh, absolutely. I, I think one thing that uh, extragalactic astronomy, so is allowed to do that Milky Way astronomy can't is that it allows you to see the whole picture like it, you you get to see so I, I think we know a lot about external galaxies but like what's the total light coming out from uh, from from an external galaxy or what's its uh, like what are its 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 morphology its like its spiral structure with it, which is something that it's a lot harder to do with if you were like inside the Milky Way because although in, in the Milky Way you do get access to, to survey a 3D picture of a galaxy from within, uh, which has its advantages, but external, but looking at external galaxies does have the the advantage of allowing you to see that full integrated 
uh, framework of what a galaxy is. Yeah, as you, um, you just look at the picture, you look at the galaxy and say, there's a bar. There it is. Yeah, <laughs> as exactly. opposed to the painstaking work to figure out and having arguments at, at uh, with your colleagues. Yeah, yeah, but I do think looking at a draw, Andromeda does off does have some promise in the sense that it's close enough that maybe at some point uh, in the coming decades, we'll be able to get uh, sort of uh, at the best of both worlds in the sense of getting uh, allowing to resolve individual stars in Andromeda while combined with getting that that full integrated uh, view of the system. So uh, I'm very excited for that. Uh, but it's definitely too far to be able to do any kind of astrometry uh, on it. Oh, sorry, there, there was a motorcycle. Oh, <laughs> um, it's just too far to do astrometry on the actual individual stars in the galaxy, right? I mean, I think you can only do I mean, that that methodology of of calculating the angle when the Earth is on one side of the of the right. of the sun and then calculating the angle when the Earth is on the other side of the sun, that only goes out to a to a certain distance and then it starts to, to run out and oh, yeah, definitely I, not two and a half million light years away or whatever. Oh, absolutely. Um, but but who knows, maybe perhaps in the coming decades, we can get more sensitive. <laughs> but... But yeah. Right. When we when we put telescopes at at a thousand astronomical units on either side of the of the sun to use the sun as a gravitational lens, then they could also do some astrometry while they're on opposite sides of the of the sun. Just you know, just just an idea. Um, but but that idea that that we've got this perfect candidate with with Andromeda that we can both we can both pick out the individual stars in the galaxy, but also be able to see it at that larger structural sense, see those spiral arms, see those dark, you could like when you take a picture of Andromeda, even just in a in an amateur telescope, you can see the clouds of, of nebulosity and the darker regions in the spiral arms and the and the new forming star regions and all the little nebulae that are all that we would see as say the Orion Nebula here, we can see little Orion Nebulas in the arms of, of Andromeda. And each one of those would be, in many cases, bigger than anything we've got nearby us. And so I love that idea of, of we've got the, our local view, but then we've also got this nice perspective that we can see the whole thing as they interact at a, at a larger scale. Right. Yeah, I think that's great. Um, let me get another question here. Um, uh, let's see. Apologies. Apologies. Um, Arjun had another question. Do, do you see, are there any stars that are in trajectories that dip in and out of the galactic habitable zone? That sort of goes back to that idea of the habitable zone. Yeah. I think you sort of mentioned that briefly. Would we imagine a star coming in and out of a habitable zone? What implications would that be? Oh, wait, oh uh, as far as like, uh, do, uh, do we understand if any stars are coming in and out of, of the Hadrable Zone? Absolutely. Yeah, because there, 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 there's a lot of evidence that, that, the, that the stars like around the, the solar neighborhood have, are not native to that region and that, and do in fact are, are sort of coming either, either because maybe they'd be like on a very eccentric orbits. And so, and so part of their orbit path sort of brings them within our range, uh, or perhaps they were on circular orbits that, that were sort of kicked out into that region. I think uh, there's, it, it's a, a lot of what I was talking about, this evidence of radio migration stems from the observations of stars in the local neighborhood that brings us to that conclusion that uh, these stars don't necessarily reflect their, their birth rates. Actually, there's some evidence that the sun itself may not have actually been born within the habitable zone, that it, its birth radius was actually a lot closer into the Milky Way, and then over time actually migrated into what we consider uh, the habitable zone. That's a really interesting idea that that you get the starting, I, I sort of, you know, if you think of an analogy as, as say like red, red dwarf stars as being terrible places to, to start out trying to form life because the star is blasting out these horrible flares that are scouring any planet for for life. But if you can survive that initial period, then you've got a trillion years of nice, cool, calm, gentle starlight coming from your from your red red dwarf star. And mm -hmm. and I sort of imagine this this analogy, you've got this 
star like the sun forming close into the Milky Way, its heart, where you've got lots of nice heavier elements, but then it's right. drifting away from this high radiation zone to a place where maybe life has a chance to to get a toehold. That's really interesting. What is the evidence for this this migration? Right. So the so the the sun is roughly like four or five billion years old, and so you can we. So we know the like the like the uh, the metallicity content of the sun quite well, and so you can also look at the the metallicity content of newly formed stars that are nearby the the Milky Way, uh, nearby the nearby the sun. And what you find is that the the metallicity of those stars that are being born are roughly equivalent are roughly equivalent to the sun's metallicity now. And so what so what that's telling you. Is that so? If the sun is here and the sun is four or five billion years old, then that, that must mean that the sun was not at was not. So if new stars have the metallicity of, of the same star now, of the sun now, then right. it must mean the sun must have been somewhere else <laughs> within the Milky Way. Okay, so so it's like there's like the metal the metallicity of stars is radiating and increasing over time throughout the galaxy as more and more stars are kicking off more and more of these <laughs> of these heavier elements, and so I can imagine this would have been very um, confusing initially, because if you saw, you looked at the sun, you looked at the metallicity of the sun, and then you looked at all the star forming regions around you said, Oh, it's about the same. Then that would tell you, Oh, so that's roughly what the metallicity of a star will be at this region of the Milky Way. But then as you add in this idea that in fact, things are like temperature is rising, metals are rising over time, you had to have migration of the sun for it to to match up. What a coincidence. Yeah, it, it's it's a somewhat it, it's somewhat counterintuitive reasoning that the fact that if you look out and see they agree is actually evidence that the sun doesn't belong. Right. That's amazing. <laughs> yeah, that's yeah. really interesting. Um uh, uh super cool. Okay. Um so Ben Kalo asks, are new galaxies still forming and what is the youngest we've observed? We know stars are still forming, but are galaxies still forming? Ooh. So I, I read this very interesting, uh, it was like article where it says that we, we've sort of left the era of, of, of new galaxies and that, and so that we're now in the area, we, we've left the era of galaxy formation that we're now in the era, the era of, of cluster formation, meaning that as structure builds up, uh, so we, you kind of get to a point where, yeah, so galaxies are here. And so now uh, you have that bound structure of a galaxy. So now the galaxies are, are sort of now coming together to to merge to form larger structures, which are now the, the clusters and the super clusters. And so, so, uh, so of course, we can't say that there are no galaxies forming, but that but that time in in cosmic history, uh, we, we've moved on to to bigger structures now. That's, that's also really, I like that idea that I mean, I know that we see these giant walls and huge like structures that are billions of light years across and long mm -hmm. that are that are that are just again gravity working its constant ongoing collapse to bring to to concentrate the universe into smaller and smaller regions and open up these big voids um and and that and that the time and and then so the the galaxies formed and they were the building blocks or even the dwarf galaxy and then they were the building blocks of the galaxies and the galaxies are the building blocks of the of these larger structures mm -hmm. what does the future hold for that as you run the clock forward will we exit the period of cluster formation right so so i, I think you as time will well, it, it gets complicated because you also have the expansion of the universe that that's pulling exploded. things apart. Yeah, limiting the maximum size. Right, and so so there gets to a point where, well, yes, you would think that gravity would just continue to grab larger and larger structure, but at larger and larger structure, things like the expansion rate of the universe becomes more important. Uh, and so, this, of course, as as I'm sure any astronomy nut is well aware. That we used to think there's this idea of the, the, the big crunch, right? That gravity would, would eventually take hold of all these large structures and, and eventually cause the expansion of the universe to uh, to to decelerate and, and eventually perhaps come back together to uh, to to reenact uh, the the big bang. 
But of course, uh, with the discovery of things like dark energy, at at larger scales, things like the expansion of the radi uh, the expansion of the universe are accelerating and thus become more important. So, so perhaps there is some uh, uh, some 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 limit to how massive the, this, this coherent uh, bounding of structure is uh, that I'm not aware of. But well, I, I know that um, ninety four percent of the observable universe is going to fall over the cosmic horizon. And we will never so if we could build a, a, a spacecraft capable of going just shy of the speed of light, and we set off in all directions, we could only reach about 6% of the of the observable universe, the rest is continue to accelerate and will will eventually be moving away from us f faster than the speed of light from our from our perspective, mm -hmm. so we can never reach them. And we talk about these ideas of, of like, what are the biggest things in the universe? And there's the local group, and then there's the Virgo supercluster, and then there's the Lanakea supercluster and bigger and bigger. But at a certain point, this idea of talking about a, a big thing, that dark energy is going to tear it into pieces, doesn't really make sense anymore. Is it a thing if it won't ever become a thing? And so I wonder, you're going to have this process where, where dark energy is going to is going to is going to you've got these galaxies that are falling inward, but dark energy is pushing them outward. And eventually, some stuff will make it across the line and come together. And other stuff is just gone. It's never coming together. And so what's left? What does that turn into? If it if it was able to cross, you know, if dark, if dark energy isn't increasing, we're not leading to a big rip, if dark energy is mm -hmm. going to maintain constant, and some stuff was able to stay inside the, the zone, the gap, the gravity zone, Mm -hmm. What does the future hold for these largest structures? One big elliptical galaxy? <laughs> I, I think it probably, I think it, it might just stall at, at a certain point because the, the acceleration, if we're assuming the acceleration isn't, uh, isn't, uh, isn't getting stronger, then eventually the, the other parts will just continue to drift away. But the, but there might, eventually reach some like agreement between the dark energy and the gravity such that the the structure sort of sort of stays still right I, i'm i'm this is this is all speculation yeah. on my part this is a paper right here i'm just telling you <laughs> <laughs> i can but i think it's interesting though you can imagine this you know there would definitely be almost perfect balancing points where the dark energy is pushing two galaxy clusters away from each other at exactly the, the, the rate that they're attempting to pull themselves together with gravity. And it looks as if you're in some kind of static universe. And so there was that, that idea of whether the universe was dynamic or static. And, and Einstein, I think, was the one who realized that it had to be dynamic in some form. Mm -hmm. But maybe you could reach some point where it appears to be static again, even though you've just got a new balance that's going on. Yeah, I don't want to get in trouble with my cosmology friends that <laughs> perhaps they'll correct me when this is over. Well, who knows? Uh, maybe this will be an article that we'll have you write or something. Um, uh, oh, and Arjun actually asked a similar, a similar question. So uh, Shabam Sundar Mahakud uh, asks, can the shape and structure of a galaxy change with time? If yes, then what would be the most noticeable changes that can be observed in the near future? Can the shapes and structures change with time? Well, yes, absolutely. Well, because uh, well, it's one of the the main drivers that that shape the that shape the the structures of galaxies is, is its interactions with other galaxies, uh, right? And so as as the as the Milky Way sort of continues its interactions with its dwarf neighbors as they continue to accumulate, uh, then this can affect how that the thickness of the disk. So. Uh, this can also affect the the for, the formation of of, of spiral structure uh, because that's actually one of the one of the leading ideas how you can get spiral structure is through the interaction. So as as the satellite falls through, and there's something special about the spiral about these the spiral structure that that emerges afterwards that uh, that's very mathematically uh, uh, intensive, but it seems to prefer the the formation of these of these beautiful spiral arms uh, after a merger. Uh, and so, so there are many ways how morphology is connected to its interaction with other galaxies, and and this is definitely a, like a continual uh, evolution that 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 I, I hope to understand more, more deeply over the course of my 
career. But you can look at a galaxy, see it awash in star formation, and know that it is going through some event in its existence right now because because it's going through some sort of merger title tale there's something something mm -hmm. is, has has kicked the hornet's nest as it were uh and as you said there are you can see other things you could see a bar no bar you can see other structures almost at a not a glance necessarily but you can it tells the story of the galaxy Oh yeah, absolutely, and I, and I think the the title features, as you're mentioning, are kind of like, are kind of like the clear giveaway uh, that there's been like a recent uh, stirring up the, of the system, uh, and also things like star, like the the, the starburst, uh, as like that gas infall from that recent encounter falls into the disk, and so it provides new fuel for for star formation. Like all of these are are giveaways that are in some way connected to uh, the galaxy's past and its interactions with its environment. Yeah, seeing a active supermassive black hole, right? Is, yeah. is like telling you that some someone just had lunch, and <laughs> and so something happened to bring that. Um, we get people every week wanting to know what the great attractor is, and I, I it's become a meme, almost a joke on my channel because because every week someone asks what the great attractor is, and so now I just I just like. I've given the answer a bunch of times that, you know, now that we have modern astronomy gear that lets us look through the Milky Way, we could see it. But can you give us sort of the definitive explanation for the great attractor at this point now? The one that will then, I can then run forever and people can then be, can not panic. Cool. I'm sorry to disappoint you, but I, I don't think I, I have a good answer for what that is. <laughs> oh no. So, so it is a, a tear in the space-time continuum where aliens are consuming the uh, the the universe from the far side of the Milky Way. That's my guess. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Uh, All right. All right. Good. No, I mean the answer that I would give, like back in the day, there was the zone of avoidance, and so there was this region of the Milky Way that you couldn't observe because it, there was just too much dust that would obscure your visible light telescopes. With the advent of radio and 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 infrared astronomy, you can now see through that and see the galaxies that are in that region. And there's an overdensity of galaxies on the other side of the Milky Way that happen to be blocked from our view. But now we have the telescopes that let us see them, and they're there. They're just galaxies, just lots of galaxies. So that's 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 my answer. But I hope I was hoping you had a more, <laughs> you know, more definitive one than it's just a lot of galaxies. Maybe next time I can give you like a very intensive explanation of the great. Yeah, attract. that'd be great because it's just it's. I see this a lot in in science communication. As we sort of switch hats on to talking about being science communicators, I see there are a lot of. I don't know. There there is like this delayed reaction in in questions and then the answers to those questions, and mm -hmm. so people want to know what the booty's void is. And, and there are all these memes on the internet talking about the booty's void. It's just this place where there's, and it's the wrong picture. You know, they're using a, a dark globule nebula to explain the booty's void. And what is it? It's just a place where there aren't a lot of galaxies. It's an under density of galaxies. Nothing, not a tear in the space time continuum. And the same thing with the, with the great attractor that, that th there was this mystery back in the seventies that people were really deeply pondering. And we now have a really reasonable answer to it. And yet, clearly, some bad science communication back in the 1970s still ripples around today that we have to deal with. We have to keep cleaning it up. And I promise you'll, you'll, you'll find more and more of these, these cleanup jobs will end up on your plate as you continue to do this job. I sure find that. Um, what are some topics that that from a science communication that you would love people to know more about? It's a, a great question. I, I, so I, I guess I, I think, I think galaxy formation is, 
I, I, I think there's, there's like a lot of uh, like immediate love for things like exoplanets or for uh, like the search for extraterrestrial life or for like the, the Big Bang, where I, I think like if you mention it, it kind of like immediately grabs people, you know? Uh, and they absolutely should, because I, I think those topics are, are incredible. But, but I, I like thinking about galaxy formation, like, like where the galaxies come to be, how, like how do galaxies come to be as, as a question that is, I think is also critical to our understanding of where we come from and where, and like, like how, like, like where, like how does life form or like what is the history of the universe? Like I, I think galaxy formation uh, sir, is also like an important question that I think uh, deserves to be sort of put on a pedestal uh, as well. And I think communicating like that, at, like, like that story of, of emergence of that beautiful structures that we see today uh, is something that uh, I, I hope would, would also uh, gather the attention uh, and that I think could be communicated more, more clearly uh, that like that that great story uh, to the to the public. Uh, that I, I, I mean, I absolutely share that that opinion, uh, and of course, as I as everyone knows, I'm so excited about Gaia for that reason that that it suddenly we now have a, this idea of of galactic archaeology that we can mm. look back in time in a in a very local way and and tell this story about how we got here. It's sort of the same thing as like genealogy. Like people are really interested in looking up their family tree to just, just understand the stories of their, of their ancestors. And, and I think you can have that same conversation at a galactic level and, and wonder about the, the stories that our galaxy has told and has been forgotten until now that we now have the tools to, to take a look at them. That's interesting. Mm -hmm. Well, Chris, um, we're sort of reaching the end of our of our hour, but uh, but if people now, you, of course, you show up uh, every few weeks on the weekly space hangout to bring some interesting stories to talk about. But if people want to follow your your you specifically, uh, w what's the best way to to see what you're working on? Yeah, so uh, if you want to uh, uh, keep an eye on me and what and what I'm doing, you can follow me on Twitter uh, at the real C car, or just find C car. Chris Carr, you're, you'll, you'll find me on find me on Twitter. Um, uh, I haven't really done much in the New York area because of uh, yeah. circumstances. But but if you're within the New York area and you have an interest in science communication and science outreach, uh, it's definitely something that I hope to start doing more again once times are safe again. Uh, and, and also through Columbia's outreach efforts, uh, uh, we we host like. When times were normal, we host like these these biweekly like lecture series. Uh, the stargazing lecture series allows people to enjoy a public lecture and then go on the roof and look at the the two stars that are visible from New York City. Uh, and so, so that that's one of my one of my favorite uh, things to get going again uh, is public lectures and and also doing more stuff on YouTube with weekly space hangout. Uh, so if you want to keep in touch with all of that and follow me and and keep an eye on what I'm doing. Follow me on Twitter at the real C car. Fantastic. Well, uh, Chris, it's been an absolute pleasure working with you in 2020. And uh, I'm really looking forward to 2021. And hopefully someday we'll be able to meet in person when we're all allowed to go places and see people and do things. <laughs> Sounds good. Definitely. All right, man. Hopefully <laughs> all right. Talk to you later. Bye. stream